need capital for your projects. <laughs> Everyone so. here. Except for the lawsuit. That's great. That's good news. Well, I probably do. I'm just cheating. <laughs> <laughs> um, object. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure why it's like doing that. Uh, but we will press on and you'll get the information. Um, so as um, Rebecca mentioned, uh, I have kind of, my entire career has been in small business accessing capital. Uh, before joining Kiva, I worked for Axiom, which is a Michael lender here in New York City, uh, as well as Green America, which is uh, what you could call a bottom of a pyramid lender. Um, so my entire world is $10,000 or less. Um, but what it's been useful for is kind of helping me figure out what capital stack options are out there for entrepreneurs. So um, I'll just walk through this presentation. Uh, what we're going to talk about today is the need. Small businesses need to access capital. Uh, what is crowdfunding? What's the history of crowdfunding? What are the options out there? Um, what are the benefits and drawbacks to each? And then finally, what are my kind of what's my recipe for success? Um, depending, you know, regardless of what platform you decide to crowdfund on. Um, so just jumping right in. Um, there are 25 million small businesses and enterprises in the United States. Very few of them are able to access traditional bank loans. Uh, there's only been 20,000 microloans made. So there's a huge discrepancy there in terms of the people that need capital and the people that are accessing capital. Um, despite this, small businesses are the greatest source of jobs in the United States. I think there's some statistic if one in three small businesses hired one more employee. Employee and unemployment in the United States would be a thing of the past. Um, so there's a huge mechanism here to create a lot of economic development if only small businesses could access the capital they needed to grow. Um, it's really difficult, but you know that doesn't make it easy uh, to access capital. Two out of three. Um, two out of three small businesses are creating jobs. Um, the statistic that I really like to share is that 7 out of 10 small businesses are rejected from a bank loan, from a traditional bank. Uh, you cannot qualify. It's very difficult. Banks aren't lending at that small of a rate. Uh, it's expensive for them to do so. Um, and a lot of times, startups are higher risk clients, and so you're just not, you know, you're not ready to take on a traditional bank loan. Um, so there's a lot of other opportunities out there that are going to provide you kind of that bridge or growth capital that you'll be able to use to eventually go for a, you know, a more traditional bank loan. Um, I'll just keep doing this and you guys can kind of see it. Uh, so I made this slide um, and I think it's really helpful for small businesses um, of all kinds. But there's a, different, there's a number of different ways that small businesses can access capital. Uh, the first category is gifts. Uh, well, gifts. Let's call it your personal savings. Let's call it the money you get from your friends and family. Let's call it grant awards or, um, you know, prizes that you can win from pitch competitions. And then crowdfunding. Traditional crowdfunding acts like a gift. Um, it's money that you keep. There's also debt. There's bank loans. Uh, there's credit cards. A number of entrepreneurs finance their entire small businesses on credit cards, but they have an APR of like 20%, um, really sinks you into some trouble if you're, if you're not successful. There's also peer-to-peer -peer lenders. There's a million of online lending platforms right now. Um, some are good, some are bad. Uh, their interest rates can really compound if you're not careful. Um, there's also microfinance, something like Kiva Zip, something like Axiom. Um, and then you're going to look at equity and investment as you start to grow your business, working with investors, uh, looking for seed capital. Um, that's always nice to have, but I think investors, I mean, who watches Shark Tank? Investors look at cash flow. Um, they're looking for businesses that are already successful and the way that they're measuring success is in terms of what kind of cash flow you're able to turn around. So what are your sales? What are your projections? What's your cost per, per good? Um, and then finally, there's profit, profit and income. Who's heard of the minimum viable product before? Everyone should raise their hand. Uh, it's a really important thing to know. Uh, the minimum viable product is the concept. It came out of Silicon Valley in a book called The Lean Startup, which I would suggest that you read. Uh, yeah, Eric Reese. 
Um, basically, the idea is you start with a small idea, you put it out there, you test it, um, you get the feedback, you adapt your idea according to that feedback, and you put it out and you test it again. Um, and you improve and iterate you know, at, at low cost until you have something that's going to be successful and it's been tra tracked and tested. Um, I really suggest, you know, I think keep a zip loan and a lot of times other crowdfunding campaigns are going to fund your minimum viable product. But you want your business to be in a place that you can start small and then grow over time as you augment your cash flow. I think that's kind of the best way that I've seen entrepreneurs grow. Some people have wild success, that's fantastic, but um, I think that, you know, the, the tried and true method is just growing gradually as fast as we can, if that makes sense. Um, so what is crowdfunding? Crowdfunding has been happening since the dawn of time. It's a community that comes together to incrementally support someone in an initiative that they're looking to achieve. Um, you know, the, the official um, expression now for crowdfunding is crowdfunding is a way to collect small contributions through an online funding platform to finance a popular enterprise. It really launched in 2003, artists. Um, no surprise there, kind of the people that really pioneered crowdfunding. Um, in, 2000, in 2008, Indiegogo really launched. Kickstarter launched in 2009. I will add that previous to Indiegogo and Kickstarter, Kiva launched and was doing internationally crowdfunded loans. Yeah. Um, only until 2011, we launched our Kiva Zip pilot, which is crowdfunded loans for entrepreneurs here in the United States. Um, in 2012, um, they signed the JOB Act. The JOB Act makes it so that you don't have to declare your crowdfunded rewards uh, on your taxes, mm -hmm. um, but you're still able to use that to grow your business. Um, and then, you know, since then, there's been a lot of one-off stories, wild crowdfunding success. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of the potato salad guy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, he put a crowdfunding thing on Kickstarter and was like, I want to make potato salad. I need 45 bucks. And he raised some stupid amount of money, like, you know, over 50K uh, to make <laughs> potato salad. He ended up having a whole potato salad party, music festival, what? and yada yada. It was amazing. Um, but, you know, I think <laughs> the nugget there is there are times that crowdfunding can really catch on and go viral and be an exposure opportunity, but it's not always like those stories are not the norm um, as much as we would like them to be. Um, so we'll get into my tips about how you can kind of leverage success and tap into niche markets greater than yourself. Um, quickly going into the Jobs Act, um, it was signed in 2012. Uh, it allows you to raise up to a million dollars. Um, and, you know, I think what this does is it frees you up to be able to access the way you would be accessing a bank loan. I think the, the message here is this is an alternative means of accessing capital that's okay with the U.S. government when you're, when you're ready to take it on. Um, there's different types of crowdfunding. The first one that we all probably know most familiarly, we're most familiar with, is reward-based crowdfunding. Uh, this is something like Kickstarter or Indiegogo, and this has a method of perks. Um, basically, I will create a profile and I'll put it onto the crowdfunding site and if, you know, I'll pitch it to my con contributors, if they decide to put in $5, they'll get some small prize. $25 gets them a slightly bigger prize. Um, you know, $100 gets them the whole product and so on and so forth. So there's an exchange. You keep the money that you raise, it's just that it can act like kind of a pre-ordering system. Um, if that suits if that suits your business, where you know you're basically funding upfront what you need to go into production or something like that that you can then send out. Um, Kickstarter is the classic example of that. There's also debt-based crowdfunding. Um, this is Kiva Zip. Kiva Zip is a loan. You crowdfund a loan that you intend to pay back over time. Uh, we'll get into to how Kiva Zip works. Um, there's donation-based crowdfunding. The example here is GoFundMe. And there's causes. There's you know a particular rallying cause that someone gets behind. An earthquake in Haiti. Um, a family member who's recently passed. 
um, putting in funds to support the family members left behind. Um, this is all around, um, not necessarily specific to a nonprofit, but more about kind of a cause that someone rallies around. And finally, there's equity-based crowdfunding. I don't know of the player yet that I think is the one to really tease out as the best example. I think everyone's still working on the model here in terms of how equity-based crowdfunding would work. But the idea is you would sell off shares of your company to the crowd. Um, get my card, keep in touch, I'll let you know when I think of the right, the right person to really talk about in this kind of section of the presentation. Um, the options. So I'm just going to quickly through, uh, walk through some of the players out there. Um, we'll hit Kiva Zip and maybe that's a good time for Steve you to, to come up and talk about your Kiva Zip experience. Um, and then we can kind of get into the benefits and drawbacks and also the tips for success. And then anytime you want to jump in, by all means, please um, share what you, what you think. Um, so the first, you know, like king of crowdfunding is Kickstarter, everyone knows Kickstarter. Um, Kickstarter is centered around ways to fund creative projects. It's not a lend, you know, it's not necessarily suited for small business. The idea is they're creating capital for creative projects. So you guys would be a good fit. Um, you might not be the same kind of fit for something like so Kickstarter. Uh, I mean, I would send, well, I would send you to Indiegogo, but, um, or keep it. Um, Kickstarter uh, is an all or nothing funding game. The word is called the tilt model. The idea is you have to fundraise the full amount of what your goal is, or you cannot keep any of it. Um, again, it's specifically targeted at creative projects, and the idea with Kickstarter is there's this network of people that are looking to invest in Kickstarter campaigns um, as a way to kind of field new and creative projects that are out there. Um, 60% of the projects on Kickstarter are less than $10,000. Um, 30% of their projects are between $10,000 and $100,000. There's a very small margin, like the Veronica Mars movie or something, you know, special cases where you can raise more than $100,000. Um, really, I think the success for having, uh, the, the trick for having that wild success is having a niche market. Um, the example of the Veronica Mars movie, um, it's a popular TV show that people knew for a long time. It was a famous actress that put up the Kickstarter campaign. She had this following. The TV show had this following. And there was kind of this wild um, bandwagon effect of people funding that movie. So they were able to make the Veronica Mars movie from a Kickstarter campaign, which is amazing. Um, but not all of us have that kind of network and niche market that we could really tap into. Um, there's a cost associated with Kickstarter and every single, um, most of these platforms, uh, they'll take 5% of what you're raising. So, uh, just factor that in, like if you, if for your business you need specifically $9,500, you need to plan for the fact that Kickstarter is going to take 5% of what you raise. Um, there's also a processing fee. The success rate on Kickstarter, again, it's an all or nothing model. Um, it's all, you know, 44%. So, um. I think one thing, when I've given this presentation before, like the one thing that I really want to be clear about is um, crowdfunding is, it takes work and it's not a guaranteed success. Um, I've seen a number of people put up Kickstarter campaigns and fail. Um, I know. Yeah, it's a bummer. Um, <laughs> well, I know a person who wrote books. Yeah. And she did a great video and it failed. Yeah. She didn't raise any money. And I'm like, I love the book. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and it's a matter of sharing, you know, um, we'll get into this, but there's kind of an 80-20 rule. The idea is you're going to put up 80% of the money that you're going to raise on Kickstarter, and Kickstarter is going to, you know, help you fund the rest of the 20. Uh, unless you're Veronica Mars, then it's going to be 20, and then Kickstarter is going to provide the 80. Um, so again, it's kind of about that marketing, that niche marketing that you'd be tapping into. Um, you bring up a really important part, uh, or point. Kickstarter has videos. Um, generally, every Kickstarter campaign is going to have a video. Uh, these videos need to be high quality to be competitive on the site. Um, it's worth investing 
Uh, if you're going to go for a Kickstarter campaign, investing some serious time and maybe even some money and making a, a good video. Uh, something, you know, actually iPhones are pretty good cameras these days, but you know, you can't shoot a selfie video on, like you're doing FaceTime and have it be a successful thing on Kickstarter. So you need to put some serious thought and planning into uh, the video and, and the campaign itself. Um, in general, I think the products that are, or the projects that are most successful on Kickstarter are music and film. Um, games are pretty successful. Uh, my cousin actually just fund successfully, um, over, you know, superseded his goal of twenty-five thousand dollars and reached, uh, I think, thirty-five thousand dollars for a board game he created. Um, took a lot of work to get there, but it's an important, you know, that's it. There's an, there's. Um, there's a market there for, I think, specifically those types of products. And that's one thing you want to do is really evaluate what's my, what's my customer base and what platform are they on. Kathy, can you just say a few words about the goal? The, the goal that is set? Oh, yeah. Well, I'll dig into this, but in general, um, you want to set a goal that feels attainable to you. You need to do a serious analysis of your own network and think about what you can comfortably raise. You also need to do a serious analysis of what kind of capital you need uh, to take your business to the next step. Be, you know, going back to the minimum viable product, what's the injection of capital that's going to help you get to the next step? Don't overshoot it, especially if you're doing something like Kickstarter because you're probably, well, you know, you might not reach the whole goal. Um, the nice thing with Kickstarter is you can set stretch goals. So you can set a minimum goal and then you can set a nice to have goal and then you can set an awesome to have goal and then you know you can you can like guarantee yourself the different levels of goals is that is that what you kind of wanted me to elaborate on there right and, and you i think this is clear to everyone you set your own goal so one yeah. person might set ten thousand the next person might set twenty thousand right i have a quick question about um the kickstarter market because you know i'm a fan of Kickstarter Brooklyn, of course, mm -hmm. but I've been giving to so many people's projects and I'm still haven't gotten one perk, not one reward. I mm -hmm. talked about that already yeah. in here, but also, you know, I know from like, preparing my Kickstarter for when I'm going to do it and as opposed to Indiegogo, like how much of, because you have all these stats, how much of um, that Kickstarter market are active? I'm not totally sure. Okay, also because I know that there are people that actively go to Kickstarter to look for the next mm -hmm. wave in products and stuff like that. So when I think about my network that I'm going to reach out mm -hmm. to, I'm also thinking that there are people that just like Kickstarter and like to give their money because that's their their social entrepreneurship, like Kiva Zip. Right, you right, know? right. So I was wondering if, if you had any numbers on people that just stay in Kickstarter and you go to, to give their money to the next product. Um, the thing, the thing with Kickstarter and Indiegogo is like you give once, you might get a perk back. I mean, people are there to field ideas, right? They're kind of the Shark Tank people out there that are looking for the next big thing. Um, I would just fall back on that 80-20 rule. Okay. Uh, be prepared to put up, you know, through your network 80 and then expect 20 to come from the Kickstarter community. Uh, there's stuff that you can do if you're, if you're funding well, they'll put you on the popular page, they'll feature, they'll say keep Kickstarter's staff pick. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, those are the kinds of opportunities within the Kickstarter model that you want to really seek. Um, for, for a Kickstarter or any similar type of um, platform, if you are getting donations or people are pledging money and then, and then you decide that, and then you fail, uh -huh. And you've seen like what you're, you know, you've got like the people that are pledging money uh -huh. to you. Do you have their contact information? Hmm. I know that Kickstarter shares your contact information when you're successful, and that's because uh -huh. you have to set up the pre-orders. I would assume. I'm always wondering, you like, if you fail, did you not? Can you still? Can you say, hey, like, can you give me the twenty dollars? <laughs> right. I'm gonna raise that. Unless it's a registered user, someone that has. Like, unless you have an account in Kickstarter, like you have created a Kickstarter mm -hmm. for yourself or that you give it to other people, where like I have an avatar, like I'm African Frames Todd, no. 
Yeah. But if I'm just if I just know you ladies and we all want to support you, it will hold the money for the pledge. And if you're unsuccessful, if they won't take the money from my account, then you'll get no information. How so we won't get, we won't get, get any no names. information. No, no, my husband's doing a Kickstarter right now for a film he's working on, and they can see the donations coming in mm -hmm. yeah. before they reach their goal. Right. And they can see. I don't know if they can see names, but I feel like he's like, oh yeah, we got such and such from somebody, and I'm like, no, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You, can that you can see names, yeah. but they choose what they do. It's just not exactly. Oh, okay. Because awesome. yeah. I'm just like, maybe uh, there's some juicy names in there. Unless I sign up for Kickstarter, have an account where you can look for me later on. Like on Key Visit, I want a lender, and you can look for me later on and but say that. Otherwise, you're sort of anonymous until yes. you have that. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I just I was curious. The names pop up, but not but not the donation. It's so like when you make mm -hmm. a donation and you have the opportunity to either have your name or make an anonymous account, but not not. But okay. unless you're a registered user. Mm -hmm. Okay, I was just always curious. Like, yeah. fail, can you still like salvage like two people? Yeah, you so can screenshot not. it. It's yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. So, thanks. Or you can ask them on the way. Um, Indiegogo, I think, is the other well-known crowdfunding site. They're a little bit different in that they'll lend to any kind of project. They don't necessarily have to be a creative project. Um, the other important thing to know about Indiegogo is uh, it's not necessarily a tilt model. It's not an all-or-nothing deal. You can keep whatever you raise. Uh, they'll just charge, the way it works is, They'll consistently charge you 9% of everything that you raise. If you don't raise the full amount, um, they'll let you keep what you raise, still having kept 9%. If you do raise the full amount, they'll reimburse you 4%, so they'll have only taken 5 Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, so that's a more flexible model. I think that that's probably, um, you know, between the two, I think that that's probably more attractive to an all of entrepreneurs when they're not totally sure. Uh, I think you know the big the big advice I would say is be conservative, set your goals, and then set your stretch goals. Uh, your necessary, your absolute, I need this, and then you're nice to have and drop some tab. Um, Kickstarter, or sorry. Um, Indiegogo's average amount raised is $2,500. Um, the meat of the campaigns are between $1,000 and $10,000. You can have the same wild success. Uh, it's just a matter of finding that niche market. Um, I already explained kind of the cost structure. Um, and the success rate on Indiegogo of reaching, you know, I think their success rate is lower because they have this option of, you know, semi-success or quasi-success. Um, these are all examples of wildly successful um, ideas on Indiegogo. Again, it has a lot to do with videos and games. Um, the other thing that works really well is uh, technology and community-based projects. Oh. I just want you to stay there. <laughs> Kiva's computer, there probably is something there. Mm -hmm. You could always just turn it and you could probably see it too. Sure. Let's see. Let's see. If, let's try one more time. If, you tell me if it's like really bothering you guys and then we'll turn it around and just do it this way too. Um, farm raiser is specific for farms, not really um, that relevant, I think, for anyone in here. But what I really like about barn raiser is the analogy. Uh, barn raiser goes back to I think Amish times when people would all get the whole community would get together and rate, literally build the barn together for someone in the community. Um, I think that's a really nice homage to what um, crowdfunding is all about. Uh, but again, it's really for food and farm, so it's not necessarily the right fit for anyone here. Um, GoFundMe is really about um, it's 
really about causes. So again, the earthquake in Haiti. Um, I'm sure you could have done a GoFundMe campaign for something around Black Lives Matter or um, something around, you know, uh, the recent GoFundMe is we recently had a loss in our family and there was a large GoFundMe campaign for that family too. member. Yeah, for someone else's. Somebody like, just passed away, um, yeah. a pair of mine just suddenly, and they threw one up and I gave $25 right away. Yeah, yeah, you can have a lot of success with that. Um, I mean, success, right? Like, I think that really this is geared more toward supporting a cause. Um, so no, number one, fundraising site for personal causes and life events, personal projects, uh, allows for charity-based fundraising. There's no like real application process. You can put up a, a, a site uh, or a, a profile and begin fundraising. Um, they do pull money from these campaigns. They're pulling almost 8%. Um, they do set goals. Um, I think because of the way that, um, because of the nature of the GoFundMe campaigns, those goals are reached really quickly because it's more of a community oriented call to action. Like think about like, oh la da, like I'm you know looking for a crowdfunding campaign. Like if someone invites you to invest in their crowdfunding campaign, you might you know kick the bucket along for a little while and then finally they'll hit you up a third time and you're like, okay, I'll do that. But there's something emotional about a cause that you jump to right away and I think that that's kind of why um, GoFundMe has rapid success. Um, kind of like I said, it's really based around causes. Um, the tricky part that I will say about uh, these GoFundMe campaigns is you need to be really careful about who puts the campaign up. There's no due diligence in terms of who gets the funds. So um, I'll share this kind of weird anecdote. Um, so I mentioned this family member. Um, he, his friends were the ones that put up the campaign, but it was for um, his parents. And um, his friend, like the money was dispersed to his friends. There was no due diligence that it went to his parents. So there was this weird dispute where like they threw a party in his memory and like the parents were like, no, you can't do that. Um, this money is raised with the purpose of going here. Um, so that's one thing as a contributor and also as someone putting up a campaign, you really want to be thoughtful about who's in control of that. That's like the gentleman in Detroit that was walking every single day to work. Like he never missed a day, and then they someone threw up a GoFundMe, and he got like over hundred thousand wow. dollars. And you remember that a guy who was walking? Yeah, that was like a really big GoFundMe one recently. He was walking like maybe I don't know twenty something miles every single day wow. in the rain, sleet, hail, snow. And then the like the, the local dealership wanted to just give him a car, and people were like, "Oh, we've already given him up over a hundred thousand dollars," but he had like no access to that because right. someone threw it up there for him over a, a story about him that went viral and then it changed his life. He was just like, please stop because yeah. you know, I have no access to this, I don't know what's going on and now it's becoming really cumbersome. And it worked out better that the dealership just said, hey, we'll just give you a car so you can drive to and fro. Yeah. You don't have anything to do yeah. his lifestyle, he just right. didn't. So just be thoughtful, just a word to the wise. Um, especially like, if, you know, this might be the right fit for you guys, you just um, and be, you know, I think the other thing here with all these crowdfunding sites is communication. Always reach out to your contributors, thank them, update them, share what's happening. I think that, you know, that's something that's true about every single crowdfunding platform. Rocket Hub is another major crowdfunder. Um, they're in partnership with A&E, so there's some funds that kind of circulate, they come from A&E. Um, they have some really great crowdfunding success tools. There are links in the back of this presentation, so we can send this out for you guys to see later. Uh, you keep everything that you raise. There's no real deadline, so you just it's the most flexible. That being said, their success rate is not that great. Um, you know, this might be because there are no deadlines, and you keep what you raise, uh, which means you're not hustling the same way to get it done. Um, again, there's going to be a cost associated with Rocket Hub the way there would be with it most other crowdfunding sites. What do you 
person you think of Rocket Hub? Because I met the owner at, yeah. uh, at an event last year, and a whole crowd went crowdfunding mm -hmm. event with Axion and um, you know, mm -hmm. Project Enterprise. And it seemed, it seemed great for products. Like when I think of your quick kicks, I did a Rocket Hub. I, I know, oh, yeah. I saw it later <laughs> on, and also your stuff was in the, the newsletter. So for like actual products, you know, I could see. What do you, what did you think about it? Um, I thought it was pretty good, but I didn't come close to raising my goal. Yeah. yeah. That was a little disappointing. And it was on the heels of another footwear campaign on Rocket Hub. Mm -hmm. That made you that, that, <laughs> that raised like $750,000. That sucks. Which totally sucked. But they had, they had a kind of a unique running shoe, but they somehow partnered with the guys from Duck Dynasty. Yes. Uh, they did. Uh -huh. They did a special camo print sneaker, and A and E was promoting the Rocket Hook campaign. Got it. And it just totally blew up. They raised three hundred, you know, yeah, you know, like seven hundred fifty thousand dollars, something like that, in pre-orders. And then I throw you mine up. Behind that? Oh. Yeah. I know and about that one. Yeah. So that didn't. You know, I raised eighty two hundred. I mean, which doesn't suck, but um, yeah. Did you give yourself a deadline? Because I know about the Duck Dynasty. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't know that there's no deadline. So when, I remember when I did, yeah, did shoes like 30, 45, mm -hmm. 60. I think 60 day was the maximum. Mm -hmm. And um, maybe I did 60. And then I got an extension mm -hmm. because they had, um, just as mine was about to end, they had, uh, they announced this um, contest with Prezi. Mm -hmm. Which is yeah. um, like a newfangled uh, PowerPoint, <coughs> and um, they said people who uh, have a Rocket Hub campaign up and running or, or are about to launch one, if you make a Prezi mm -hmm. presentation relating to your Rocket Hub campaign, you can enter this Prezi presentation contest. Mm -hmm. um, so I. In three days, I learned how to make a Prezi presentation and put one up, and I ended up being the grand prize winner oh, of the Prezi. So, and as, by entering that, they automatically extended my campaign for like an extra 30 days oh, until geez. the Prezi competition was over. So that helped a little bit, and then I won the Prezi competition. So I got a thousand bucks. So that was, right. that was Steve has a knack for winning things. <laughs> Um, cool. So that's that's insightful feedback that you can kind of get lucky on Rocket Hub in a way that you might not be able to on something like Kickstarter. And the reason I chose it as opposed to Kickstarter mm -hmm. is two reasons. I met the owner, uh, the founder also, uh, Mies. Yeah, uh, he was cool. He did a yeah he did a little presentation at um, Creative Village or something like that. Anyway, uh, yeah he like a meetup group and he did a crowdfunding educational type of talk, and um, so I found that interesting. So uh, I met him, and uh, they seemed very accessible, and um, I liked the uh, keep what you raise aspect too. Um, so uh, yeah, I went with them, but I think they have much less traffic mm -hmm. than Kickstarter. I would say that's true. Yeah. Thanks. And then there's Kiva Zip. Um, Kiva Zip is crowd lending. I obviously work for Kiva Zip. Um, the cool thing about Kiva Zip, we started as a social lending platform to make loans, small loans, for entrepreneurs in the developing world. So uh, we were started in 2005. Uh, since then, we've leveraged over $700 million of uh, capital for entrepreneurs in over 86 countries. Um, we have a community of a million point four lenders, and the cool thing is you make a loan on Kiva Zip, you get paid back over time. Uh, it'll be $25, let's say, over you know the course of an entrepreneur's repayment term, you get $25 back, and then you have the choice to either re-lend that capital or keep it. Um, we find that um, over half the time, people are choosing to re-lend that capital, so you can recycle the same $25 across the world start in Cambodia, take it to Uganda, end up in Peru. Um, and that's kind of an amazing story and a testament to the site and the fact that there's capital flowing through the site. Um, 
that's fantastic. Uh, in 2011, we were getting a lot of feedback from our lender base saying, this is great, we love on, you know, investing in entrepreneurs in the developing world, but what about the United States? There's poverty here, it looks a little bit different, but it exists. Um, and that coffee shop around the corner is really struggling, particularly after the recession, when banks really tightened up on what they were willing to lend entrepreneurs. Uh, so we developed Keep a Zip for the United States entrepreneur. Um, the qualities of the of the loan, it's a 0% interest loan. This is social lending. I am going to keep a zip to invest in an entrepreneur with the belief that if I invest in him or her, they're going to improve the chances of success for not only that entrepreneur, her family, and also the community that she's providing this product or service to, thereby developing economically um, you know, the world in which she's living. Um, so there is no return on investment other than the social return. Um, the loan is a max up to $10,000, uh, typically anywhere in the United States it's only up to $5,000, two months of this job serving New York City borrowers, that was not enough for a lot of entrepreneurs to take on a crowdfunding campaign, so we upped it to 10 specifically for the New York market. Um, and the term is um, up to 36 months, depending on the size of your loan will augment it. Uh, to be less. So um, it's a 36 month term for a $10,000 loan. And you said that you, you loan internationally. We do lend internationally, but Keep a Zip is really kind of the more US based product. Okay. Um, but we do have you know lenders that are lending internationally and then also domestically. Um, the loans are used for any business purpose. We want to see that whatever we're lending to you will increase your capacity to be revenue generated. So is it purchasing the inventory for your store? Is it purchasing a piece of equipment that's going to make it 10 times faster for you to produce whatever you're making? Um, is it a truck to make your deliveries? Just something clear that helps us understand how this money comes in and how it's going to help more money come out. Um, how does it <coughs> make any money? Yeah. We're a nonprofit, so um, when someone makes a contribution on Kiva Zip to someone's loan, Kiva is going to ask, "Hey, do you want to opt in and make a 10% or you know 20% donation to Kiva on top of what um, you're lending?" Five percent of the time, people opt in to make that donation, but it amounts to two thirds of our operating budget, and the other third comes from philanthropic relationships. There's a million point five lenders on Kiva. So that's a testament to the to the volume of transactions that are happening, and so we're able to take a small piece of that uh, and keep our lights on. Mm -hmm. um, so good question. I'm like I'm really happy when people get to that question. You did right away. So good. Um, so again, we're zero percent interest. We have a really high success rate. Um, that is a testament to one, the lender community on Kiva, and two, um, for any entrepreneur that is in New York City serving New York City markets you can qualify for loan matching. What is loan matching? Loan matching is a one-to-one -one match of every contribution that comes into your profile. So if you set a goal for $10,000 um, and I lend you $25, you get 50 toward your goal of 10,000. You still raise 10,000, you still pay back 10,000. It's just that uh, we have this partnership with Deutsche Bank and MetLife Foundation. They basically have giant lender accounts that just double every contribution, like any lender. Um, and that helps you accelerate to your goal. Okay, I just want to follow this. As, I mean, this is intriguing, only because, frankly, I've never heard something like this before. You literally lend for any investment into your business up to how much? 10,000? Up to 10,000. And you expect to pay back within 36 months, mm -hmm. and there is no cash. Uh-uh. That's unbelievable. <laughs> no, sorry, I about this a few classes ago. Yeah, yeah. So we told you about this. Yeah, she Remember, we, she was, she was like, she, we cheat over the argument. I was like, no, we're not arguing. This is this is what it is. Yeah. Because there's a lot of tax benefits to lending for commercial operations, to philanthropic lending. So it's, it's advantageous for them to do that. And that's how the money is. They get the tax write off through Kiva because it's not a profit. Yeah, and there's, I mean, I'm not but on that side of everything, yeah. so I can't talk specifically but about it, but there, you know, there are CRA credits and whatnot that yeah. they can be but doing by putting out money to, um, Yeah, but I'm people, 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 people,
money, I feel accountable to those 145 people that I call my all stars. You know, like I, if if you ladies gave me money, <laughs> I'm just like, listen here, here's this money back. Thank you very much. And even when I missed the payment by a day because I was trying to transfer money from the PayPal into money from my account back into the PayPal in order to, it took four days and I didn't know that because I was keeping all the money in the PayPal to pay it. And still, they sent me a text, <laughs> emailed me, and like I wasn't even a day late. It was a, it was just a PayPal issue because I never transferred the money. And I felt like, oh my goodness, <laughs> you know, but yeah, I, I, I was, I felt real accountable to pay it back. And I know from people that have given me their money that they're getting like cents because it's over 24 months. Mm -hmm. But I have a friend that's excited because every month on the fourth, she knows that I'm serious about paying her 15 cents back. Yeah. You know? We have a repayment rate of 92.5% here in New York City. Uh, the way that we're underwriting these loans, we're not looking at credit scores, we're not looking at traditional uh, ways that banks are gonna look at your loans. Um, instead, we have what's called a private fundraising period. We're counting on you to bring 20 to 30 people for a $10,000 loan to invest in you as little as $5. We just wanna see that you can reach 25, let's say, people to invest in you. And if they, that 25 people are willing to invest in you, that tells us, you know what, this person's community has verified them as a credit worthy individual. And then, it, it doesn't matter how much you raise from each person, you, they can be as little as $5 from each person. If they're your closest friend and family, I would hit them up for more, especially because you're gonna pay them back and it's gonna be doubled. Um, but that's an aside. We'll get into that later. Um, once those 20, we believe that you're credit worthy when, when you can raise the, those 25 people. And then the effect of that is it's no longer a faceless thing that you have to repay. It's your friends and family. These people know where you live. <laughs> your reputation's on the line. Um, you're going to pay back your loan because you've made it, you know, these people have made a commitment to you and you want to honor that because otherwise, if you didn't, you wouldn't have any friends. Um, the other. <laughs> Tell them, your mom gave me money. My mom and Tariq are like best friends. It's and ridiculous. her mom bought friends from me. Like that means something to me. Yeah. The other effect, um, I think, with all of these sites is there an opportunity for exposure for your business. Um, Kiva is a nice one because there's kind of this cyclical community of lenders that are looking to support entrepreneurs. Um, but once someone comes and lends to your business, it's up to you to convert them to a brand ambassador, business advisor, or customer. Um, have your e-commerce site ready to go. Say, and all of my lenders get a 20% discount purchase here. Um, um, you know, I've had someone go on and say, hey, I'm looking for tax advice. And then I've had a lender go on and say, hey, I'm actually a tax consultant want to just meet up. Um, so, you know, it's up to you to kind of facilitate those connections to take them further. I've had, um, these are kind of a sample of two of our entrepreneurs. Tina truly needed that uh -oh. oh, there she is. Tina needed that five thousand dollars specifically. Like she just needed that five thousand dollars to to help her business. Um, Tara, and so that's like really a traditional borrower on Kiva. Tara's business was doing fine. She didn't necessarily need an injection of capital, but she purposefully put a loan up on the site so that she could gain exposure. She has a social, she has a sustainable fashion line. Uh, Kiva's lenders are all about sustainable fashion lines and other kind of socially good products. Uh, so that was a total niche market move for her um, to put her, her campaign up, get an interest-free $10,000 loan, but more importantly, be exposed. And re she recruited, I think in the end, like, you know, over 150 lenders who, you know, then she started making sales from those lenders. So you can use the loan in two different ways, I think. One's an exposure mechanism, one's an access to capital. Mechanism. How complicated it is to create the project? Sorry? How much efforts? We're, uh, Kiva is a lot more simple, I think. Um, it's, so, there's any, any uh, crowdfunding site, you're gonna create a profile. The profile's generally gonna look like the executive summary of a business. So when uh, we were talking earlier about executive summaries of business plans and business plans, have them. 
do them, and then boil them down to the most simple, clear, crystal clear version of it, and that's what you're going to want to put onto your any crowdfunding platform. Um, the Cuba Zip platform, uh, the profile has four components. One is the picture. We're not video capable. Um, I like that because I think it levels the playing field for a lot of our entrepreneurs. We're, we're working with people that are you know, immigrants, uh, people who have been traditionally marginalized from classic uh, fund, funding or um, traditional banking. Um, so not everyone has the capacity to make a video, and I, I'm okay with you know, not having that on the site. So the picture is really the most important part. The picture needs to show you in your place of business. You need to be smiling. It needs to be a well, you know, a high resolution, brightly lit picture. If you send me a headshot, if you send me a logo, if you send me a selfie, I'm going to send you back. Uh, and I'm not going to post you until you send me a quality picture. iPhone 6s have great cameras these days. Um, it can be pretty casual, pretty genuine. A lot of people have computer-based businesses. This works for a picture a lot of the time, so long as it's shot and seems genuine, shot well and seems genuine. Uh, the other components of the profile are your personal story. Who are you? What do you value? How did you get where you, where you are now? What's your background? Your business story. When did you launch your business? What have your challenges been? What have your successes been? What's your, what's your mission? What are you all about? And your loan use. What itemized list are you specifically raising this loan for and how is that going to increase capacity to be revenue generated? Um, that's going to apply to most crowdfunding campaigns. That's a question. Um, your company, can, can they only do this once? You can reapply for, uh, you have to raise the full amount and pay back the full amount. So and if you did that, that, you can do it again in like a few years down the line? Yeah. Or? Okay. Yeah. And I have some people like, um, particularly farmers, where it's like, they'll go for the loan and then at the end of a successful season, they'll pay back the full loan and then just go up for another one. You can go for double what you would raise for the first time. Um, Kathy, will you speak a little bit? I've heard you talk about the lending that takes place within the community. Mm -hmm. Steve, I know you have a story on that as well. Yeah, maybe now's a good time to kind of let Steve share his, his key visit experience. I won't be too biased. Um, and, uh, you know, I would say, like, channel your questions to Tariqa, Giselle, Gail, uh, and Steve. Uh, they're going to give, you know, like, I'll answer questions all day long, but you want to hear from the people like you uh, that are, you know, in your shoes. Uh, so maybe, Steve, why don't you just kind of share your Kiba Zip story, and then we can, we can save more Kiba Zip questions to the end, too. I do want to, like, make sure I get you guys all the tips for, that I would share for any problem. Sure. Um, well, I'll start by saying that I met Catherine a couple months prior to me putting up the campaign, and um, you know, I first heard about it then, and uh, you know, got very intrigued by it. And uh, wow, no interest capital. That's, that's great, and no equity. <laughs> yeah. So um, uh, you didn't mention yet about the like trustee. Oh. Thing too. So, um, I, do you you don't have to have a trustee? Is that right? Okay. So, um, one way to facilitate, I guess, becoming um, a successful applicant on Kiva Zip is that they have a network of affiliates or trustees um, that can kind of help vouch for the people that are putting up their campaigns on there. So, um, I had uh, just won a uh, business plan competition and the organizing institution was one of these affiliates and um, so they offered to vouch for me as, as a trustee uh, for the key visit campaign. So um, that helped. So um, uh, as Catherine said, I got my picture, you put up the profile um, and I think what's very important in crowdfunding in general, but particularly in Kiva Zip, because people really are doing this purely for philanthropic reasons, is the story behind your mission and your business is really important. So, um, you know, the social component or, or tugging on the heartstrings or whatever it is to make people want to give you money and say, boy, that's really worthwhile cause I want to get behind that. So I mean, I think that's true for all crowdfunding, but most of the
the other crowdfunding platforms, you know, you're getting a perk or a good in return. So it's not purely philanthropic, um, although they have some of those platforms too. But keep it zip, these people get nothing back but, you know, good feelings inside. So, um, you know, it should be a good story. Um, so I worked hard at, at uh, telling my story there. And uh, uh, the inspiration for my product son who had a disability and these shoes were created to help him and then I talked about how you know, my company once we're up and running and revenue generating we're going to be, be giving a portion of our profits to agencies that uh, provide services for people with disabilities and our long-term or stretch goal is to um, build a distribution center in New York City that will provide long-term sustainable employment for so um, I think a lot of people got behind that, apparently. And uh, we did have a successful campaign uh, after the initial, um, would be a private funding period where you have to get people within your own network to contribute, as Captain said, as little as $5. Um, and like she said, it's not the amount of money that you raise during the private funding campaign. It's just a specific number of people that you need to get to contribute something. Show yet yeah, I know this guy and you know I can trust him with my five bucks or twenty bucks or whatever it was. And uh, what was amazing about this is once I reached that level, I remember it was on like a Sunday evening at like eight o'clock. I got that last person within that private funding network to contribute, and within twenty minutes, random people started contributing money, and like it blew me away. And within three weeks. I funded the ten thousand dollars, and uh, yeah, I was getting yeah. contributions from all over the world. Um, you know, some were twenty dollars, some were a few hundred dollars from people who I, you know, no clue how you know who they are or how they found me or anything like that. So I mean, it, it was the experience in itself was inspirational for me. Um, it was really incredible. So uh, and another thing that you didn't mention, which is awesome is that you can choose to select a grace period before or maybe not. Okay. You took that away. You took that away? Yeah, sorry. Oh, well, let me <laughs> Yeah, you, 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 you made it. I made um, it under the wire? Yeah, you okay. did. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think a couple of you guys well, you know, it, under the wire. It's yeah. an important feature. I'm yeah. sorry to just sort of see that uh, gone because, like, I'd be in, in bad shape right now if I didn't have the grace period. Well, when I did the campaign, they had a grace period. And you could say, you like, how quickly do you want to start repaying the loan? Immediately, in three months, in six months, the maximum is six months. So I said, okay, six months. Um, so I have six months before I even need to make my first repayment. And um, that's really important for me because yeah. my loan funded in the end of January, I'm just getting shoes in now and hope to start generating revenue. My first payment's not due until September. So I think yeah. we're on track. <laughs> <laughs> we do it on a case-by-case -case basis if there's a real need for um, a grace period. The last grace period we provided to a business was someone who was affected by the East Village gas explosion. Um, that's kind of an extenuating circumstance. Uh, we did take it away because we live and die by our repayment rate. Like our, you know, the only way that we can continue to do this is if we have a quality repayment rate. Otherwise, why would lenders lend? Um, and grace periods, while they're awesome for the entrepreneur, they do have a decay effect on um, someone's ability to pay back the loan, so that's why we did take it away. Um, that being said, it's worth asking. I can pitch it to headquarters and see if we can make an exception. I can't promise you anything. I can almost tell you it probably won't happen, uh, but that the other awesome thing is that the minute you were fully funded, you got three emails and there was money in your account. Yeah, and it was like, great. Yeah, that money was, was that was like amazing. Like a day. It it was like oh you fully funded next PayPal you have right. a delivery of so and so money and then the third one was like it's sitting in your account and you're like what? <laughs> and I don't know if that works. Oh, so much. Thirty days after your first, days. after it's and dispersed. Just, uh, let's say I need ten thousand and uh, thirty-six months about 
what do you want to amount <laughs> <laughs> it's a monthly uh, payment across the day. Yeah, it's just one thirty-sixth of whatever you raise. Minus two hundred eight thirty-three for twenty-four months of five thousand dollars. Can I ask though what like Steve is it? I'm sorry, yes. So, but how terrifying is that? Like, because you think depending on your revenue and how quickly you're generating it or not, you're starting to pay back like a good amount of money for a small business every month. Like, I was that. I mean, I know you have the grace period, but I'm really interested in that because it seems terrifying. Like, it's the same reason I don't want to take out a loan from a bank either. Yeah. Like, I don't, I don't want to have to like. Well, that's why the max debt is service. ten thousand. I know, but was it, that just seems you know given what the parameters of a small business are? That sounds terrifying to me. That's well, what I'm trying to say. Well, uh, you know, I I have a, an angel investor on board that, you know, if push came to shove, he could come in the position where he could throw a little bit more money in or what have you. So, uh, yeah, semi-terrified, but, you know, I, I'll figure it out. It's a huge, I mean, that's an, and it's important that you are concerned about that, right? Like yeah. any time that you're going to access debt, you're going to be in that situation. And yeah. And keep as if it's zero percent, you know, on yeah. some of these right. other places. Mm -hmm. Like, what's your other option? Sometimes a credit card. Yeah. Like you're going to pay even more. Yeah. For that. That was another thing that we didn't say is the fact that there was no credit check. So this couldn't, this loan couldn't help build my business credit, but it also couldn't deteriorate my credit. So you can't report. I'm always doing my payment, but yeah. you can't yeah. report. So, right, and you know, if just you great. fall behind, what we have, what we say you need to do is you need to write a conversations post. Um, we have a conversations tab. Actually, look at Steve's; it's so awesome. Steve has a hundred and nine uh, conversations posts. He's doing an awesome job of They're updating his things. lenders. Um, <laughs> um, this is where this is where you connect with your lenders. This is where you make them customers and brand ambassadors. But if you fall behind, I had a borrower whose catering van got broken. I'm going to stop it for a couple of months. I'm not going to be able to make these repayments. And we said, listen, what you need to do, this is patient capital. This is social lending. What you need to do is you need to go on, write a post about what your situation is, own up to the 150 people that have invested in you, and then pay back what you can. Is it $25? Is it $50? Just something. Put it back. Um, so that people get a little ping that says, you got two cents back from, you know. Um, and just, just that's how you stay in the game. You know what I mean? Um, and we find when that happens, people are actually pretty supportive. Um, they're not like, where's my money? But if you if you run and you don't say anything, that's when people really get upset. Right. What are the tax, are there tax implications of it? No. Okay, that's great, okay. Yeah. Kevin, there's still the expectation or the encouragement for people to be loaning to others? Yes, so that's an important thing to add too. Um, it's not necessarily a requirement yet, but one thing I highly encourage, um, whatever platform you pick to crowdfund your campaign, go make a contribution to someone else's campaign. Um, you're going to get the experience of what it's like to be the lender or the contributor. You're going to get in the head of the people that you're trying to recruit. Um, it's not required on Kiva right now, but we're talking about making it a requirement. I think that it's really going to improve our repayment if people really understand like what we're all about. Um, it's as little as five dollars. You're gonna get paid back. You might as well do it anyway. I know Steve went and lent to someone else who was working yeah. with dis disabled uh, communities. Yeah, just, yeah. While well, my campaign was going on, I was perusing some of the other um, uh, borrowers on there, and there was a campaign up by a guy who had a coffee shop in, I think, Pittsburgh. And um, he was going to use the loan money to reconfigure his coffee shop, do some remodeling, so that he can use it as a training ground for people with disabilities to, to learn how to work in a coffee shop or something like that. And uh, so I thought, well, that's right on my alley. So yeah, um, you know, I, I lent him 20 or 25 bucks. And, it can hurt from the karma perspective, and it didn't, so I'm really glad I did. 
So, um, I'll, I don't want to spend, you know, I totally understand Kiva's it might not be right for everyone. So let's just work through kind of the rest of the presentation. We can come back to Kiva's it specific questions later. Um, the benefits and drawbacks of crowdfunding. Um, weird. Sorry, I didn't know what this was. Um, so, you know, I think the biggest problem with crowdfunding is unfunded campaigns. Again, be really clear about how much you need. Be really clear about how much you're comfortable to raise from your community. Um, the second drawback is undelivered rewards. Tariq mentioned, like, it's a, you know, some of these reward-based systems are, are like pre-ordering systems, but a lot of times these entrepreneurs aren't necessarily ready to turn out those rewards. I had a friend, he had like a t-shirt, a t-shirt company. He had a wildly successful crowdfunding campaign, raised like 900, no, I'm sorry, $90,000. Oh, no, but that's funny. That's it, um, he, he had a great product. A um, couple of problems. One, he didn't know how to price it right, so he was underpricing his shirt, and he didn't know that until he was trying to meet his orders. Two, um, he was not ready to meet his orders. So it took him like a year to send around those shirts, and by then all of his contributors were like, hey man, where's my shirt? Um, so, you know, there's, there's some issues there. Um, oh, can I chime in? Yeah, now? please. Because I did the Rocket Hub campaign, uh, this is almost two years ago. And, um, at that time, I already had a factory lined up to do the production. And according to them, you know, like, oh, you can have your shoes in a couple of months. And so mm -hmm. I put up the campaign to take pre-orders, among other things. There were other perks also. Um, but uh, it was almost two years ago. I'm just getting my first ship like in the next week. Yeah. Cross my fingers because okay. they've been saying that. For the same story. So uh, yeah. So um, you know, I communicated with the people. You know, for good or for bad. I only had like a couple people that I didn't know that pre-ordered shoes. Um, but all the other perks that were non-shoe items, you know, they those were all fulfilled along. Some of the shoes I was able to get pre-production samples and fulfill those. There's a couple shoe orders still hanging out there, and I had emailed all of them a long time ago, and I felt so bad. And I said, you know, I'll give you the option. I'll totally refund your money that you put into the campaign, um, or I'll double your order for this, you know, whatever you want. And everyone yeah. said they'll wait and take the extra shoes. Yeah, but it's at your cost. Yeah, yeah but. Yeah, I mean, it's, so the, it's the right thing to do. Yeah, <laughs> totally. Um, yeah, so you need to be prepared if you're going to offer perks to, to turn around those perks. Or not. Apparently, there's no real consequence if you don't, except for like feeling really bad. Um, Reputation. Reputation, yeah. exactly. If you know someone gets in tons of these great videos mm -hmm. <laughs> of new technology, and I'm like, all these people that have, I don't mean to work con, but they haven't been delivered to. Like now on other platforms, my, my max is $100. Really like $75. Yeah. And I give the, my if max that. Like you to go fund me because I know that's, I'm doing that for a funeral. Right. Or I'm doing that for like something else. Yeah, that kind of teases out the third fraud and compliance I already shared um, the anecdote around, around that. The benefits of crowdfunding is it's a marketing and engagement tool as much as it is uh, an access to capital tool. So you can galvanize supporters, you can create connections, and you can generate sales. Um, so think of this as much as a capital tool as a marketing tool. Doesn't matter what site, again, you're going to use, just you know, go about it strategically so that you're prepared to kind of leverage these contacts that you're going to make. Okay, tips for success. Um, first tip, tip zero, is pick your platform. Um, I hope you all come and, and start key visit applications, but I won't be offended if you use another platform. Uh, like uh, Rebecca said, you can still take my card and I'll still be happy to kind of coach you through whichever one you pick. Um, but, um, you know, you kind of have the options here. I'm always happy to kind of like talk about it. Yeah. Is there a contact number or something you can so if you're setting up something on your site? On me. Uh, I'll pass around my card so everyone has my, my contact. Um, oh, gosh. Tip. Oh, not so much. Yeah, on other platforms.
platforms, yeah. they might have like a general help section. I know some platforms are going to have people that kind of, Kickstarter I know is reviewing everything that comes onto their site, but I don't, they're, you know, their engineering is a lot more refined than ours, and so their platform is going to have more constructive stuff. Um, most of our tips and tricks and stuff are going to come offline via email from me and my team. Um, um, yeah, we're still helpful. Yeah, no, we're great. <laughs> we're really helpful. We're like borderline obnoxious. Um, so anyway, um, so we already talked about being, you know, being prudent about how much you choose to put onto the platform. Um, I love small loans. Small loans are super easy to fund. Um, if you need two thousand dollars, go for two thousand dollars. If you need five fifty. $5,054.33, I love that. That tells me that you really thought about what you needed, you know what I mean? I, that's, those are my favorite loans, people that like have it itemized. Um, What's the average of the cubic of loan? Nationally, I think you're, it's, uh, it's $4,000. I would say in New York right now, we're probably hitting around $7,6500, uh, because the, the $10,000 option is, is attractive. Um, so one, decide how much you need. Two, craft your campaign. Any campaign uh, needs to be made personal. Tell me why this matters. Tell me about you, why it matters for you, what impact this is going to have for you, your family, uh, your parents that you're taking care of, the children that you're supporting. Um, connect it, you know what I mean? Like, like Q is it especially because it's social lending. But any platform, like this is all social, emotional, superficial um, connections that are happening. Like I use the word shopping online um, for not just Kiva, but you know, any crowdfunding site. So um, you want to appeal to someone on an emotional level. Like what's gonna make you call to action? It's gonna be either urgency or an emotional connection. Um, like what's gonna make me stop my day and put in money to someone's campaign? do a million other things. Um, keep it simple. Think of this as the executive summary of your business plan. You want this to make clear, simple sense. Uh, we live in a BuzzFeed world. Nobody reads. Um, keep it brief. Keep it succinct. I say that like every time you're laughing because I use the same joke over and over. No, they need uh, to pay you for that. You can say so many other things, but BuzzFeed's right. Yeah. Um, I love lists. Lists are great. Um, Show how you'll use the money. What are you purchasing or investing in that's gonna increase your capacity to be revenue generating? The more specific you can be around that, the better. Um, a refrigerator on my food truck lets me stay out three to five hours longer, which will enable me to make X more sales, which will enable me to earn X more revenue. Perfect, you know what I mean? Like just make it clear how this is gonna be, you know, important for you to be revenue generating. And um, I think kind of going back to make it personal also emphasize the impact. So, you know, again, like, who does this affect? Um, Kiva will send you tips and tricks at nauseum about how to do this. We'll also read your profile, we'll send you back if we have edits. Um, it'll be kind of a two way thing until we think you're ready to go. Take a great photo or a great video. Um, just make sure that this is compelling. This is the sweet spot. This is where you galvanize your lenders to come to your profile. Well, I meant, I meant on the other platforms, the video. Yeah, so I just said keep photos. This is my favorite picture that I've ever gotten for a Kiva profile. Farmers have this unfair advantage because it's super scenic, whatever they're doing. Um, but like, throw your kid in the picture. That totally drives home the impact, you know what I mean? He's wearing no shoes at all. <laughs> yeah. I didn't say that, Tariqa said that, but it's... Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, smile. Connect. Um, it's really important. Four, prepare yourself to put in the time. Um, Kickstarter and bar Barn Raiser, I mean, Barn Raiser is a great example. It has a niche market of contributors. Um, it has a high success rate, but they coach every person that's putting up a profile on Barn Raiser to be able to invest 
an hour to two hours every single day that your campaign is up. Ping people, send it to blogs, send it to news stations. If you follow any newsletters, send it to those newsletters. Um, get really creative about who you ask. We'll talk about that in a second, but just be prepared. Like, don't do this if you're about to have a baby. Don't do this if the holiday season is coming up. Just be strategic about when you're gonna put this up, when you need the funds by, and how much time you're willing to put into it. Um, it is, you know, a gift of capital um, in one way or another, 0% interest loan or, you know, a gift that you keep, but it's not without work. Um, so, like, the biggest thing that I need to stress for everyone here is, like, when you go to put up a campaign, just be realistic. I would say that Kiva requires less time than other platforms. Uh, again, that's because, uh, one, loan matching, and two, the community of lenders that are actively contributing to there's a really great tool um, at the back of this presentation put out by Rocket Hub that like it like computes it all for you. It's like how much are you trying to raise? How much do you think you can get from your network? And then it spits out how much time you think you should do. So I highly suggest that you check all that stuff out. <clears throat> Five, ready your troops. Before you even launch your campaign, tell people that you're doing a crowdfunding. There's a rule of three. Um, you need to make three impressions before someone takes action. Some would say it's more, some would say it's up to seven. I think it depends on who you ask and what the action is. But tell people before you're doing it, like twice. And then be like, hey, hey, it's up, let's go. You know what I mean? Um, now. Now. Um, then you're gonna launch after. Um, tell everyone in advance. Um, Build, if you don't feel like you have a good network to share your profile, don't put up the profile yet. Make a Facebook. Start hashtagging things. Generate a follower base. Get connected to communities that are relevant to you. Um, create a network before you really launch a campaign if you don't feel like you have one. Um, it's not worth it to put up a campaign and not have success. Um, again, there's this 80-20 rule uh, between your network and the crowd that's going to be lending or investing in. Uh, so just be prepared for that. Um, this little ask yourself what's what's your network worth that comes from the Rocket Hub tool. So I'll, I'll um, again it's at the back of the presentation. I encourage you to check it out. So ready your troops, and then recruit more troops. I really liked this. Um, <laughs> She's like networking more. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, you have your core and your team. Then you have an outer circle of your close friends and family. Uh, then you have a greater community, and then you have, you know, beyond. Um, again, submit to relevant blogs. Just find those niche, those niche crowds that you can kind of uh, tap into. And then you launch. Um, put up your, your crowdfunding campaign. Share it on social media. Facebook is going to get you likes, not necessarily dollars. Um, <coughs> Keep updating, keep sharing, tailor your message to every single person. I, the anecdote that I always share is um, actually to get this job, I'm still like kind of weird that they had me do this, but to get this job, they asked me to see how many people I could make, get to make Kiva loans. Um, so I was fundraising for a job that I didn't yet have, which I'm still a little upset about. Yeah, it's, it's not cool, but I did it because I really wanted the job. Um, and I knew people to come in and Yeah, I was like, see, they were like, see how many people you can get to make a loan. How many you get? I got 70 <laughs> in a week. Um, That's, That's very good. Um, and then I got the job, so. Um, but what I did was I like really made a list of each of my networks, and then I tailored message, I reached out to each one, and I tailored that message to each one. I got really personal about it. I said, hey, a job is on the line. For you guys, you say, hey, a business is on the line. Like, um, I just straight up, you know what I mean? Like, Do you want me to pay my rent? <laughs> more or less, like, a, and, you know, just be really upfront about kind of like what you're doing and why it's helpful and like how you need that support. Um, get creative about who you ask. Anyone that I ever bought a wedding gift for, I was suddenly hitting up. Um, oh yeah, no, wedding bridge. Um, and um, less relevant to my story, but the other story is target your niche. So is there a collective of artists out there that really need this space in New Jersey? Find them. Get them to recruit. Um, and then hit people up. I think the other 
The other important thing is um, continually update people. So you're going to reach out to you know 50 people about your loan. I'm going to say 25 are going to hop right to it and do it. Other, the other 25 are going to be like, yeah, of course, and then they're going to get distracted. They're not going to get there. Um, update them. Say, hey, I'm 25% raised. My favorite tip is say thank you. My favorite tip, I love this because you're totally guilting people. You say, oh my gosh, thank you so much. I'm 45% raised, this much to go. And you do it knowing that that person hasn't contributed yet. Um, and then they're going to feel really guilty that all these other people have and they need to jump in and do it too. Um, share updates um, on Facebook. I think that this is how you would convert your Facebook community is you continually, you know, I would say every week say, here we are, we need, you know, this much raise, this much to go. Next week, here we are, this much raise, this much to go. Um, and then, you know, over time that's going to connect people and bring them in. Um, the other thing that I think is really useful for successful crowdfunding is creating a huge sense of urgency. Um, people are way more likely to make a loan. Um, if they see you have 15 days, they're going to be like, yeah, I'm going to get to it when I get to it. If they see you have one day and it's bolded and underlined, do this today, then they do it. Um, I've had borrowers with like two invited lenders on the last day of fundraising and they need to hustle and find, you know, the last you know, 18 people to invest in them, and they do it. And it's because of urgency. It's because of the, you know, the way that they're able to compel people. <coughs> um, maintain separate email lists, uh, tailor your message to different people. Um, don't freak out, there's gonna be slumps. Again, really leverage that urgency to, to get people um, in the final hours. Finally, uh, keep your promises. Send, your, send out your rewards, repay your loans, and keep updating people. Now that they're invested in you, it's you, up to you to you know, make them your, your champions, make them your community of support. Here's a link, you know, just the links that I would share. Um, we'll send it out, so don't worry about like writing down all these backslashes and 